Welcome, everybody. It is so nice to be here with you all today. It is this morning here in New England. Kieran Phillips and I will be guiding you through our field trip today. I hope you all are ready to have some fun and also learn a little bit more about things like black holes and exploding stars. So today's virtual field trip features NASA's Chandra X Observatory. The Chandra X Observatory is a sister telescope to the Hubble Space Telescope that we'll be talking about um, in, in a bit more detail today. But I would like to start off by making things hopefully feel a bit more interactive and launching a poll. So Karen is going to go ahead and launch our first poll of the day and hopefully um, you as long as as well as your students can all join us in it. And the question is, if you could work at NASA, what would you like to be? And we've got a few options here. Feel free to put additional options that you're considering in the chat or in the Q&A. But we have astronomer, we have astronaut, we have computer engineer, and we have food scientist. These are just a few of the many, many different occupations um, of all of the different jobs that are required to really help make things successful at NASA at headquarters and also throughout all of the various centers and contractors. And it looks like most folks are actually interested in being an astronaut, um, as well as a food scientist, which I think is actually pretty cool. Great. All right. So, Karen, if you want to, oh, looks like we've got one for everybody now. So cool. All right. If you want to share the results out so folks can see what the votes came in as, um, it looks like a pretty distributed spread with um, only computer engineer um, falling behind just a little bit. So a little bit about my own path. Um, I actually started out in biology. So I did not plan to work in astronomy when I was younger. I did want to be an astronaut, but kind of realized like, no, I do not really enjoy even going to the amusement park. So strapping myself into a rocket and blasting into outer space, perhaps not something that I want to do. Um, but I really love the idea of science. I love the idea of thinking of like questions and trying to find answers. And for me, my path eventually led me away from biology and into computer science. And that was a really important change in my career potential um, because learning how to code for me was like learning how to speak another language. And it quite literally helped me unlock various uh, secrets of the universe, if you will. And so today I spend a lot of my time doing things like data visualization, virtual reality, augmented reality programming, and other kinds of work in imaging. Um, again, there are many, many different paths uh, that you can take uh, when you're working on a NASA mission. Just a reminder that please feel free to ask a question in the chat at any time. Um, while I'm talking, Karen will be able to answer questions and vice versa. You can put them in the chat or you can put them in the Q&A and we'll be happy to help as we can. So when was Chandra launched? Chandra was launched back in 1999. So we're not quite at 25 years that Chandra has been operating in outer space, but we're getting there, which is pretty exciting. Um, I'm going to play just a short video to you from Colonel Eileen Collins. She was the first woman to command a NASA space shuttle mission, and she was the woman that commanded the mission for Chandra, which was STS-93. And here's what she has to say about getting Chandra up into space to do its work. I'm Eileen Collins, commander of Space Shuttle Mission STS-93. I was also the first woman to command an American space mission. On July 23, 1999, my crew deployed the Chandra X-ray Observatory. We had trained specifically for this flight for over 16 months. My crew felt personally responsible for the successful launch and deployment of Chandra. We trained heavily in simulators. We did standalone simulators with our training team, and we also did joint integrated simulations. Leading up to the launch, my crew was very confident that we were totally trained and ready to go. We weren't nervous. We were just primarily focused on doing the best job that we could. That summer, we had two launch delays. The first one on July 20th was due to a problem on the space shuttle. And then the second launch delay was two days later, and that was due to thunderstorms in the launch area. But we were happy to finally get the launch off on the third attempt, about the third time that the crew had uh, strapped in to the shuttle. People often ask me, what does it feel like to be in a space shuttle launch? It sounds like you're in a room that's on fire, as you've got the boosters and the engines burning around you in what we call a controlled explosion. There's so much shaking in first stage when you're on the solid rocket boosters that if you try to write, you would not be able to read afterwards what you wrote. We had a successful launch and we were able to proceed with procedures to get Chandra on its way on flight day one. So looking back, it was a perfect deployment. 
our crew watched the Chandra float away. We took our final photos and our final videos. As we watched Chandra float away, it seemed like it was almost like a sailboat on a calm sea. We knew that no one would ever see the Chandra again, but that we would still feel its presence as it continued to send its data and its information to Earth for many years to come. Wonderful. We still actually talked to the astronauts that were involved with launching Chandra into outer space. Just a fantastic bunch. So Chandra goes about a third of the way to the moon. Um, it really operates in that highly elliptical orbit so that it has a fantastic view of our, our universe and the X-ray universe particularly. Chandra is about the size of a school bus and it looks like it's sort of wrapped up in foil. That's to keep the telescope nice and cool so that it can do its work. And what does Chandra get to look at? It gets to look at things like exploding stars, things like areas around black holes, things like colliding galaxies, and then also many other kinds of objects like baby stars and mature stars, um, things like planetary nebula and, and a host of other types of objects. So the entire universe it consists of many different kinds of light. We have gamma ray light, we have x-ray light, we have optical light, we have infrared light, and we have radio light. We have all of these different kinds of light that make up the electromagnetic spectrum. And what this is like, it's like having different kinds of tools in your tool belt, right? So an astronomer can use any of these different kinds of light to answer questions and to help figure out different kinds of problems. So Chandra looks at mostly X-ray light, whereas the Hubble Space Telescope looks, looks at mostly optical light and things like the Spitzer Space Telescope or the James Webb Space Telescope looks at infrared light. So we can take an example object called M51, and this is a beautiful spiral galaxy. Um, what it looks like in X-ray light, you can see all of those purple colors. Those are just showcasing the really hot bits of information that we are getting on this, this galaxy. So really at the center of the object is that bright core where there's a supermassive black hole, for example, and there's some nice lanes of really hot gas and dust. And then we're seeing all of the sort of temper tantrums from those young stars that emanate out at really hot temperatures. When we're looking at the same field of view in ultraviolet light, now we're seeing mostly, I don't know, thousands and thousands of these younger stars that are giving off a lot of UV radiation. We can look at the same field of view in optical light from the Hubble Space Telescope, and now we're seeing all of the sort of dusty lanes that make up that beautiful spiral structure. And then finally, when we look at it in infrared light, now we're seeing just sort of the bones of the galaxy. We're seeing past some of that dust into the cooler areas of gas and other material. So we use all of these different kinds of light to get a better picture of what this galaxy looks like. And when we combine them into one image, now we're able to tell a really lovely story about this beautiful spiral galaxy. You can clearly see where those red lanes of that cooler, um, gas and material are coming in from the infrared. You can see where that sort of greenish color from the all the areas around those spiral lanes is coming in from the optical light. You can see those really bright purple sources, all of those energetic things like exploding stars, like black holes of different sizes, like stars that are hanging out together in pairs. And that's giving us all of those big bursts of high energy. Um, so being able to see all of those different kinds of light in one image is really helpful to astronomers to be able to figure things out. So we're going to go ahead and take our next poll if Karen wants to launch poll number two. And this poll will ask you all about the electromagnetic spectrum. So based on what we talked about, which is not a part of the electromagnetic spectrum? Did I talk about gamma rays? Did I talk about burst arrays, X-rays, invisible light? You tell me which one of those is not part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So go ahead and put your answers in. And so far we've got uh, folks that have gotten the correct answer. Yes, that's lovely to see. Um, indeed, burst arrays are not part of the electromagnetic spectrum. We just made up that term, it's not a thing. So it looks good. All right, we can go ahead and share the results out and move on. All right, so I'm gonna take you on a short tour of some of my favorite sites to see in the universe. 
Most of these images that we're going to look at are different kinds of light. There's going to be X-ray light from Chandra, of course, my favorite X-ray observatory, but we'll also see optical light from the Hubble Space Telescope, like the one here in front of us now, as well as infrared light from the James Webb Space Telescope and others. So what do we get to look at? We get to look at things like stellar nurseries. Stellar nurseries are kind of what they sound like. There are just these beautiful areas where stars are being born, these little factories of creation, essentially. And so this image is called the Pillars of Creation because all of those stars are indeed being formed in these tall pillars of gas and dust. We can also look at other types of objects, however, like areas of more mature star formation. This is where the stars are starting to sort of turn into their teenage years. You can see some of the really bright temperamental areas of this region in the X-ray light, which is that really sort of purpley, um, pink kind of color. And that's where there's just a little bit more of like a temper tantrum coming from those young stars. And this is also showing us beautiful infrared light from the James Webb Space Telescope. We can look at stars that are hanging out together. This is our Aquarii. It's a system of two stars that are sort of dancing together, which causes these little bursts of energy from them. And that makes this really interesting sort of bird-like structure that you're seeing, again, in X-ray light from Chandra and optical light from Hubble. And then we can look at some of my favorite objects in the entire universe, things like exploded stars. So stars that are really massive, way more massive than our sun, when they start to run out of fuel, their cores collapse, and then they just explode their guts out into the universe. And it makes a really fantastic structure to look at, such as this, which is called a supernova remnant. And we're looking at the supernova remnant in many different kinds of light. There's infrared light, X-ray light, as well as optical light. And another object that's a favorite of mine, this is an area around a supermassive black hole. And this supermassive black hole is the very one at the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. So this is like the inner 400 light years around our very own Milky Way galaxy's core. And a light year, by the way, is the distance that light travels in a year, which is about 10 trillion kilometers. So this is a, a pretty large space of the sky that we're looking at. And of course, we can also look at other kinds of supermassive black holes and other kinds of galaxies. We're now looking at Hercules A, which is incredibly busy core of a very, very powerful supermassive black hole that's bursting out these jets and really harsh angles from it. And there's a lot of really hot gas all around um, the center of that object. And we can also look at galaxies that are in groups. This is an image from the James Webb Space Telescope. There are five galaxies pictured here together. Um, about four of the galaxies are all sort of close to each other. And the one galaxy on the left is actually a bit of a foreground galaxy. And there's a really bright region where there's a sort of shock wave from that high energy material that we can view from the Chandra X Observatory as all of that real excitement and that gravitational pull and attraction is happening between those galaxies. And then finally, we can even look at clusters of galaxies that look like they're smiling back at us thanks to something called gravitational lensing. It's a bending of the light. So that's just a really quick uh, review of the various objects in our universe that telescopes like Chandra, like Hubble, like the James Webb Space Telescope and others get to look at. Let's go ahead and take a break. I know not every class can stay on for the full time. And I know it's great to get questions and answers in as we can. So Karen, if there are any questions lined up in the chat or the Q&A, um, let me know, else we can take some of yes. the questions from before. We have a great question. Great. Uh, can a star live forever? Oh, that is a great question. Yeah, I wish they could. Um, so for the most part, stars are like people, they have finite times that they can live. However, stars have a much longer span of time that they can live compared to humans. And it really depends on the size or the mass of the star. So like the mass of the star pretty much predicts how long it'll live. So the most massive stars in the universe, the things that are like hundreds, if not many times more the size of our sun, for example, those stars are so big, they live these like fast, furious lives. They only live for millions of years before they explode their guts out all over in these catastrophic events. Stars that are more like our sun that are sort of average size kind of you know, maybe not super exciting, but very dependable. Those stars are great, um, especially for us. It's a great star for life to have developed near. 
Our star has been perfect for us. Our star will probably live for like another six, maybe seven billion years. That's billion with a B. And then eventually it'll puff off its outer layers and its core will collapse into something much smaller. And then stars that are very small, things like brown dwarfs, things that are um, more compact objects, those can actually last for a really, really, really long time. Like many, many billions of years, perhaps 55 billion years, um, which the universe is not old enough for us to know exactly how long they can go, but they take such little uh, energy, if you will, to exist that it seems like they could last for a long time. So even though brown dwarfs are perhaps not the most exciting things in the universe, because they're not going to explode, they're not going to puff off their outer layers in a beautiful like structure, they're they get to exist for an awfully long time. Um, and so they'll have been able to witness many, many things in the universe, which I think is is also pretty exciting. So that is a really fantastic great. question. Do we have anything great. else? Yes, we've got we've got a few great questions, but oh, I'll great. pick one for now. Okay. Maybe I great. think we have time for one more. Um yeah. Donnie from Knowlton, who's very into space, cool. would like to know Me too. generally <laughs> what you know about neutron stars, just generally oh. or kilonovas. Yeah, wonderful. So neutron general. stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So neutron stars are actually really important too in our bigger picture of stellar evolution. And I might try to find a chart later to help show this in a more visual way that I think is usually helpful. But so when certain kinds of massive stars explode, so again, let me back up. Our sun is not massive enough to explode. It's a kind of an average size. Some might think it's boring, but it's not. It's actually very exciting for us. However, it is not massive enough to explode. So that means it's not qualified to create a neutron star after the fact. Stars that are more massive than our sun, probably at least I'd say 10 times more massive than our sun. Um, and just a size reference, you can fit about a million Earths, I think, into a sun. So our sun is pretty big to our standards, but in the universe's standards, not all that big. Um, but more massive stars, as they're running out of fuel, their core collapses. Um, there's like a lot of like heavy elements that have built up in that core um, before they explode. Once they collapse and they explode their guts out all over the universe at that moment of the explosion, what can happen is a couple different things, depending on the sort of calamity of all the energy and how big the star was. Um, if it's really, really massive, it can turn into a black hole. If it's a little less energetic or a little less massive, it can leave behind what's called a neutron star. A neutron star is really this highly energetic, but super, super dense leftover core of the star that's exploded. And we're going to be seeing an image in just a minute from the Chandrax Observatory that will talk about neutron stars in some more detail. So I will leave some of the detail for that. But for now, I'll just say that it's essentially that leftover core. And just like a teaspoon of that material in a neutron star weighs as much as more like, I don't even know, like millions of elephants, like a teaspoon of it. So we're talking something really, really, really dense um, that's shoved down into the size of something relatively small, um, like something the size of say Manhattan. Um, all right, I think those questions took me a little longer to answer. Do I have time for one more, Karen, or should we move on? Um. I think you can answer one more. Kind All right, there's a short very one. Short and <laughs> nice and sweet. I'm yeah, bad Darren, at short answers, but I will try. <laughs> Darren Dobrowski asked, why do some black holes spew out material? Would oh, that's a great question. All right. I can't give you a very short answer to that, but I will try. Or I'll just say, all right. Um, so what happens is I think there's this idea that black holes are cosmic vacuum cleaners and they kind of just go around sucking things up, right? Which is really not the case. They're kind of in their orbits for the most part. There are some rogue ones. Um, they're in their locations. They're kind of doing their thing. And what happens is when material gets too close, that gravitational pull of a black hole is so incredibly strong that there's kind of no escaping it once you get to a certain distance of the black hole. So things around the black hole are kind of pulling in and circling closer and closer. And what can happen as the material gets really close to that black hole, it can cause like what's called an accretion disk of material around it to form. Now, what happens too is you can kind of think of it, I'm not sure this is the best analogy, but you can kind of think of like if you were on a, trying to get on a merry-go-round that's already moving, um, and some of that material, like if you jumped onto that merry-go-round, right, you're gonna be going at a different speed and you're kind of like, you wouldn't necessarily land on the merry-go-round. You could kind of be ricocheted off. That's the sort of thing that's happening with these, these jets of material. 
Um, it's not something that has fallen inside the black hole yet. Something that falls inside the black hole essentially can't escape. Um, but for the material that's close to that black hole, it can be spewed out in these really relativistic jets. So that's the best I can answer that question in a short time. Um, I'll move on and try to get back to that at the at the end. So let's dive back into the presentation. I see there's still quite a bit of activity in the chat and the Q&A. So hopefully Karen can help you out with that. Um, while I'm talking, but please do continue to drop in your questions um, as, as I'm going. So, all right, so Chandra has been up in outer space doing its thing a third of the way to the moon for not quite 25 years. That means it's traveled over 3 billion kilometers. It's taken over 3000 trips around our earth. It's collected over 25 trillion bytes of data. And to do all that, humans have had to upload about 4 million lines of code in order to both take care of the spacecraft, but also to like operate and analyze and collect all of the data. So it takes quite a bit of work to keep all of this going. And I wanna hear from Sabina Hurley. Um, until very recently, she was our flight operations team program manager. Um, she has recently retired um, and moved to a different uh, country, but this is what she has to say about Chandra and how special it is. They knew the science that they wanted to do, the technology to do it didn't actually exist countless engineers had to solve a whole host of problems to get Chandra on orbit. The mirrors on Chandra, those mirrors had to be smooth to the level of a couple of atoms. You're skipping photons, so they need to be atomically smooth, and they have to be really delicately aligned because you need all eight mirrors to be working together, right? And they are now focusing on an instrument, and the instrument chips are only four inches square and you have to hit that four inch square every single time. And that's not actually good enough. That would just give you a blob. So to get the imaging you want, the resolution you want, you have to hit exactly the same spot on that four inch square every time. And the spot you have to hit is less than the diameter of a human hair, 10 meters away. Then you have to do this on Earth, but it's gonna operate in zero G. So you need to figure out how can I align these so that they'll be aligned on Earth for testing. But then when it's up in space, it has to stay aligned. You can't go up and fix it. So how do I build all the structure around it so that they stay aligned so precisely through all of that? So once you've done that, you have to make sure that you're controlling the temperature of those mirrors to within fractions of a degree. But you're in space. It's a harsh environment. The engineering and the level of testing and trying and retrying and testing to get just the mirrors right is absolutely mind blowing. So Chandra is definitely a special piece of equipment. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the various parts of the spacecraft and how it works, how the solar panels work, how the solar shade works, all of the bits and pieces, we have a lovely VR tour that you can do on your phone or on your desktop um, at chandra.si.edu slash VR. And I think Karen will also pop that URL in the chat. In the meantime, I'd like to take you all on a brief tour of our operations control center. This is where sort of all of the business of Chandra occurs. So we've just walked into the control center. There's a little lobby at the beginning, and then there's a little sort of exhibit on the left that talks about the history of the telescope and how it was built. It took about 23 years to build Chandra because the technology had to be developed. Chandra was so cutting edge at the time. It was absolutely, everything was just so brand new. Um, there was a lot to figure out on on building Chandra, and it took quite a bit of time to figure that out. Um, but the engineers and the technologists, the scientists were all incredibly successful at doing those difficult things that Sabina talked about in that video just a minute ago. So as soon as you walk into the main room of the control center, um, this is the main control room. There are a couple banks of computers on the left is where the command controller sits. Um, this is where the person that's making sure all of the commands that go up to the spacecraft are all correct, verified, ready to go. And on the other side is where the lead spacecraft engineer sits. Um, the engineer is essentially making sure that anything non-routine is being taken care of and kind of leads anything around that. Now in the middle area over here, the second row of computers, that is where all the spacecraft subsystem engineers, they're kind of making sure the Chandra spacecraft itself is operating, you know, beautifully and healthy. Um, and then up in the front row is where the scientists are sitting for the instrument team. So the instruments that actually capture all of that 
X-ray goodness out in there in the universe. Um, those instrument scientists sit in that front row. And then up in the very front is this bank of monitors. Now this bank of monitors is actually pretty important. It's giving you a lot of information because Chandra goes a third of the way to the moon. We can't reach Chandra, not with a, a space shuttle or any kind of you know similar physical mission. Uh, we don't have astronauts that can go up and fix Chandra, for example. So any time that we have to take Chandra to the doctor just to see if it's like, uh, you know, give it a sort of checkup, if you will, we have to do that through code. And we do that by understanding how Chandra is operating. We get information downloaded to us from Chandra through NASA's Deep Space Network um, every eight hours. And that gives us update information as to like the health and safety, if you will, as well as gives us all of the scientific information that Chandra has captured during those observations. You can see on the screen at the very top, there are a number, number of boxes that are all green. The green boxes are essentially a thumbs up. That means those systems are operating well. Then right below that is a system of what looks like radar dishes. That is NASA's Deep Space Network. That's the system of radar dishes that essentially talk to the various spacecraft that NASA has. And Chandra just takes its turn to talk to one of the Deep Space Network dishes uh, at any time. And then on the left, you'll see where Chandra is in its location and its uh, elliptical orbit, for example, and that is constantly being updated as well. And then there's more information that tells them about like the temperature of the spacecraft, the telemetry and all of that other information. So all of these charts, all of these boxes, all of this information is just telling us that Chandra is operating well um, and is in a safe kind of place. And this room is really important just to make sure everything um, is functioning. During the pandemic, we had to make sure we took extra precautions, but there is somebody in this room at all times. Uh, if we have a blizzard or a hurricane up here in New England, somebody has to be here at all times. Um, so there is actually a sleeping berth not too far away from the control room so that scientists, engineers, technologists can be on site no matter the weather that's happening um, outside. And you can see we have a local artist as well. Uh, one of the engineers drew this picture of a bunch of people holding up Chandra saying, keep it up Chandra Ops. Um, definitely better drawing than I could do, uh, though I'd be happy to know if we have any artists here with us today. So I'm gonna stop share of the control room tour. We can put the URL for this tour in the chat. You can take this tour yourself at any time so that you can learn more about the various rooms of the control center. Um, it's a pretty fun virtual tour, so please feel free to go ahead and uh, get back in there if you need to at some time. Okay, so I talked a little bit about how Chandra communicates with NASA's Deep Space Network. This movie just plays a little illustration of that. There is this object in the universe that Chandra wants to observe. That light has been traveling from that object to us over an extended period of time. Most objects that we're looking at in the universe are pretty far away from us. So Chandra looks at that object, it captures all of those photons, all of those packets of energy, and it's focused down through the mirrors, they skip down through the mirrors and then are focused at the base of the telescope where the scientific instruments reside. And then it's packaged up into what I like to think of as a digital suitcase, a digital suitcase of binary code, a system of ones and zeros that captures and encapsulates all of that information. That binary code, that digital suitcase is then transmitted down to Earth through NASA's Deep Space Network before it makes its way to one of our computers uh, here in New England. So binary code is really just, again, a super, system, super simple system of ones and zeros. We're gonna go ahead and take a poll. I think this is poll number three, if I recall. If you wanna go ahead and launch that, Karen. And the question is, what is binary code used for? Is it used for talking to computers? Is it used for talking to dogs? Is it used for sending messages in a bottle? Or is it used for talking to a toaster? Multiple choices are allowed. So if you have more than one answer, please feel free to select multiple items. And the reason we made it multiple, you'll see in just a second when we talk about the answers. So it looks like most everybody agrees that it's for talking to computers. Yes, indeed. So we are not yet capable of talking to dogs, though if we've all seen the movie Up, it's something that I think would indeed be fun. Certainly it's not used for sending any messages in a bottle. However, it can absolutely be used for talking to a toaster. 
So most of the smart devices that we have in our household these days, whether it's a smartphone, whether it's our laptop, whether it's a smart refrigerator, or even indeed a smart toaster, we use binary code to be able to talk to any smart electronic device. So talking to computers is definitely correct. So A plus for everybody here, um, but also you could have selected talking to a toaster. So let's go ahead and share that out. Thank you, Karen. All right, so binary code, what is it? It's just a system of talking to machines. Um, telescopes in space like Chandra, like Hubble, like the Webb telescope, as well as so many other devices, they all use binary code. It's just a system of storing and transmitting information. And the ones and the zeros are actually important because they're like computers that need electrical um, systems. It's either an on state or an off state. So that electrical pulse, if you will, is really important. So binary code sort of provides that lovely connection. So um, once we get our binary code and we unpack that digital suitcase of information uh, that we've been able to capture from the universe, then we start doing stuff with it. We use software and we use coding to be able to translate it into a table of information. This is one of like the first steps of unpacking that suitcase. We've got the time, the location, and the energy of each little photon um, each little packet of energy that struck the detector, that scientific instrument on Chandra uh, during the observation or, or any other telescope that's similar like Hubble, like the Webb Space Telescope. Then we're going to use more software and more coding to be able to translate that data, that information into something like an image. There's definitely lots of other steps. Sometimes that information goes into spectral, which is like some sort of, um, it's like a fingerprint, the DNA, if you will, of light. Sometimes we're going to a, a light curve or other kind of plot, but when I'm working on it, we bring it into an image, for example. This image is Cassiopeia A. It's one of the very first images we ever released from Chandra. What we're looking at right now is just the raw data of an hour's worth of observation time. Now, going back to the question that someone had on neutron stars and the bright white spot at the very center of this image, that is actually the neutron star, the leftover core from this star that exploded its guts out all over the universe. And just one hour of looking at Cassiopeia A, our good friend, the exploded star with Chandra, let us see that neutron star for the first time ever, which was really, really exciting. So now we can take our information that we've been capturing and we can use more software and more coding to add like color information. That color information is representing the information. It's talking about how hot an area might be, how energetic an area might be, where the brightest areas, for example, those really bright punchy oranges and yellows in this case are showing us those really really energetic regions of this exploded star but fast forward about 20 years we've looked at cassiopeia a many times since we've now looked at it for over a million seconds so much better than that first one hour observations and now the color is actually telling us something completely different the color coding here that we've applied with yet more coding and software is essentially a map of all of the chemical emission from this object. So for example, the iron from this exploded star is uh, concentrated in purples kind of along the perimeter. Um, the calcium, the silicon, the sulfur, we're seeing that as green, as yellow, as orange. And then around the rim is a really high energy shock wave in bright blue. So the colors are actually giving us more information about this object and letting us map it. We can do more with our data. We can bring it into 3D environments and map it to understand which of the light is moving away from us and which of it is moving towards us using really great science observations and also really great math. We can also take that 3D model and 3D print it so you can hold an exploded star, if you will, in your hand. Um, we can bring that into virtual reality. This is one of my students who's walking around inside this exploded star. And we can even translate it into sound so that we can sort of learn about it through hearing different pieces. And here's what it sounds like. So all of those different versions of that data that I've shown you all on that beautiful exploded star Cassiopeia A, they all came from that binary code that I showed you at first, right? All of those ones and zeros 
um, that binary code that I showed you was actually the data, a tiny part of it, from our Cassiopeia observations. And all of these different methods that we've taken through it, all the different coding and software we've used to be able to represent that data just helps us extrapolate all, all of that sciencey goodness. Sonification, the idea of translating information to sound has been a really useful tool. Over the summer, you might have heard the sound of a black hole um, that went viral back in August, and that was a project that we had worked on. It's not a direct translation. It's not a direct recording, I should say, of sound. We don't have um, speakers out there in the universe recording it. What we're doing is we're capturing the light, and then we're using really good math to be able to figure out what the sound waves are around something like a black hole. And then we're translating that sound, um, that information into sound so that we can hear what those sound waves might represent as. So here is sonification of a supermassive black hole. So sonification is a really useful tool. Um, at this point, I'd like to hear from my colleague, Dr. Daniel Castro on why we get to do these fun things with Chandra. We didn't know that stars could emit X-rays, for example, on the way they do it. We didn't understand how stars blew up. We didn't understand black holes in nowhere close to as much detail as we do now. We don't understand the clusters of galaxies that make up the, you know, the web of space-time in the detail that we understand it now. Chandra represents a huge step forward in astronomy in general. Cool. All right. So it takes many different kinds of computer languages to keep a Chandra mission going. And I will say that because Chandra was built up over about 20 years and has also been functioning for over 20 years now. You can see there's a bit of a smorgasbord of different languages that it's taken in order to keep things operating well. Um, so some of the older languages like Fortran and C, for example, MATLAB, and then some more modern languages like C Sharp and Python, for example, um, G code and Unity scripting. We use a host of different kinds of scripting languages. All of this is both to ensure that the telescope is operating well and to keep things functioning, and then also to work on the data. And that includes distributing data to other scientists, to people around the world. It takes a lot of different computer languages to make that happen. So we're going to take our next poll. If Karen wants to launch poll number four, I believe we're on. And the question is, if you ever coded before, what have you used it for? And multiple choices are also allowed in this case. So I actually learned how to code way back in the day, back in 1994 by learning HTML. I built a web page. That was my very first exposure to learning how to code. And now I have a job that uses coding all the time. So that one sort of entree activity um, was really important for me kind of getting the skills and the confidence in order to figure out what to do with coding and how it might be useful in a job. And it looks like folks have also built web pages, cool, made music, awesome, created games, cool. Um, we've done a lot of app development recently with coding. There's a lot of incredibly useful things that you can do uh, with different coding languages and scripting languages. So wonderful. Of, uh, careers are there working for different NASA missions and different kinds of things in astronomy. Oh, so just a few of my co colleagues are up here on the screen now. Dr. Wanda Diaz, she's an astronomer and computer scientist. She understands stars. Um, she actually uses sonification to turn data from cosmic objects into data that she can understand. She's been blind since she was about 19, for example. Uh, Robert Hurt is an astronomer. He also creates things, visuals like images, works on the data from telescopes. Jessica Mink, she is a software developer and also a data archivist. Christina Hernandez uses code to build things. Uh, she's an aerospace engineer at JPL. She's worked on different kinds of Mars rovers, for example. Many, many different kinds of careers that use coding um, in astronomy. I feel like astronomy essentially runs on coding. It's, it's pretty integral. So we're going to take our final poll of the day, and then we'll be moving over to Karen pretty soon. Um, so Karen, if you want to launch the last poll, our question is, do you think space telescope research can affect people in their everyday lives? And there's just a single choice answer, either true or false. 
you want to go ahead and give us your answer. And I'm going to be talking about this in my next slide. And it looks like we've got 100% for true so far. Yes, indeed. It's like you're reading our minds. So uh, great. We will share those results and move on. So yes, indeed. Um, technology from the Chandrax Observatory and similar X-ray telescopes that led up to Chandra, for example, have been pretty important. Um, once you have a NASA telescope that's been made, a lot of that technology that has gone into the creation of the telescope is then open for business for other people to be able to use and to adapt in new ways. And so there are a lot of incredibly creative people that have been able to come in and to adapt technology from Chandra and similar X-ray telescopes, for example, in order to improve medical imaging, medical diagnostics, things like mammograms, things like MRI machines have all been made uh, more high resolution, healthier and safer thanks to technology from Chandra. Airport security actually originated thanks to X-ray telescopes and today has been made um, more useful for scanning planes, for example, for any signs of weaknesses um, as like a quality assurance kind of thing thanks to X-ray telescopes. X-ray te technology is also used to be able to support marine life. They do uh, quite a bit of marine life um, monitoring thanks to X-ray technology. And then in other kinds of manufacturing, quality assurance and similar technologies from X-ray telescopes have also been adapted. So pretty much any day, if you're buying something at a store or medicine at a pharmacy or taking a trip or going to the doctor, there's been some tiny part of that, that experience that's been touched by telescopes like Chandra and some of its you know sister and brother telescopes. So um, with that, we are going to switch over to Karen and she is gonna take you on a tour of some things that you can try. So. Uh, Karen, go ahead and share your screen. Hello, my name is Karen. There is oh, actually cool. two, uh, mm -hmm. two, two inquiries as in as to what would happen if you were in got sucked into like a black hole or found oh. yourself in a black hole. What would happen? Yeah, I would not want to be that. I would definitely not want to be in that situation. So what happens is as you approach a black hole that gravitational tug is incredibly strong and your body or spacecraft, whatever, would essentially be spaghettified is what they call it because you would be slowly pulled apart towards that black hole until you are skinny at the level of molecular spaghetti. Like we're talking really, really, really thin, thin, thin spaghetti, way thinner than a capellini or an angel hair pasta. Um, and you would just be slowly stretched out as you sort of circle that drain and then go past the event horizon into the black hole itself. So a human would not survive that process that, that we know of, um, pretty much nothing will. Um, black holes have, you know, ripped stars to shred around them. They've had meals of meteors and asteroids. Definitely, it's not good to go into a black hole. So I'm actually seeing your screen now, Karen, if you want to take over. Great. I would like to highlight three popular activities out of those that are listed here in the vi virtual field trip teacher guide that you may have pre-downloaded at the registration site or from the confirmation email. If you don't have the field guide yet, we will include a link to it in the post tour email being sent out, or you can still download it from the registration site. We will also drop the link into chat. And a special note for educators participating in an hour of code, many of the activities in the field guide are a great complement to an hour of code. Recoloring the universe is our first highlight. It's the left section here. You'll learn basic coding while using data from Chandra and other satellites on exploded stars, star forming regions and black holes. And it's a really good one for beginners. You'll find a series of video tutorials to follow along with. You'll use the code to just to adjust real NASA, de NASA data from exploded stars, black holes, just to name a few. If we move to the right side, the Tinkercad activity is our second highlight from the virtual field guide. In our last activity, recoloring the universe, you're learning code. In this next activity, we will take you through the basics of Tinkercad, which is a free browser-based 3D modeling software. In this activity, you will have a chance to explore basic 3D modeling that you see down here in astronomy. You'll see a range of different projects 
you could begin your journey with really simple ones like 3D modeling of an earthquake system and then work your way up to more complicated sh shapes like supernovas and pulsars. Reach Across the Stars is our third highlight. It's a free augmented reality app, which is for both Android and iOS, where you can explore stories of women in science. There are short stories and some longer extended journeys where you can ask questions. You can interact with a 3D 360 virtual reality of Mars. As an example of the activity, I'm going to show you the journey of Christina Hernandez, an instrument engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab for the Mars 2020 rover. Being an engineer to me was a game changer. It gives me a platform to speak about things that I'm passionate about, such as science but it also taught me how to be self-sufficient, how to think about complex problems and find simple solutions, and how to use my ability as a collaborator, as a leader, as a team player, to help us answer some of scientists' most difficult questions. With that, we wrap up our field guide highlights. Kim previously mentioned that binary code is the format in which we talk to machines. And that will lead us into a fun binary code activity that we can do right now. This is a chart that shows how English language alphabet characters corresponding to ones and zeros. In this activity, you'll write your capitalized initials in binary code. There is a binary code chart for lowercase letters as well, but today we'll, we'll use the capital chart. My initials are KP, and so my binary code initials would be 01001011 for K, and then for P, 01010000. And you can go ahead and share your binary code initials with your teacher or pop it in our chat. And in the meantime, Kim is still taking questions. Wonderful. Thanks, Karen. So yeah, please do share your binary code initials in the chat. And I'm going to go back through uh, the archive of questions and see what we have left to answer. Uh, looks like Grace from Knowlton wants to know how many universes there are. Well, I am no cosmologist, but I can say we know for sure we are in one. Um, but whether there are multiple universes, it seems like it's a possibility. But honestly, it's way, way above what I actually know anything about. Um, so that'd be a great question to ask a cosmologist or to find a good book on. Um, and let's see, it looks like Helena from No One Wants to Know How Dangerous an Exploding Star Can Be. Lots of curious kids here, she says. Um, so yeah, an exploding star could be dangerous if we were near one. Um, fortunately, the nearest star that looks like it might explode sometime soon, and when I say soon, that's in astronomical uh, time frames. Um, we have one star that's called Eta Carina that's about, I think it's about 7,000 light years away from us. Um, so 7,000 times 10 trillion kilometers, it's really far. And that star looks like it could go supernova, perhaps in our lifetime or not, perhaps for like say another 500 years. Um, it's really hard to narrow things down when you're talking astronomical time frames, as I mentioned. Um, but if that one did explode, it would definitely give us a beautiful show at night in the night sky. We would definitely see it with the naked eye, um, but we would be totally safe from it. So we wouldn't get any bad radiation our way. There is no other star in our local universe that we know would be dangerous for us. So we are pretty safe here. But I will say that if you're elsewhere in the universe, so maybe I should back up for a second and just say we're in a relatively like calm galaxy, I guess, maybe, if that's a good way to describe it. The black hole, the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy is in a state of what's called quiescence, I believe. It's like a, um, you know, it's not overly busy right now. It's not really snacking on a lot. It's not eating a lot. It's just kind of napping for a bit, if you will. Um, and our galaxy as a whole is not undergoing like a massive burst of star life and star death. Um, we think in our galaxy, a, 
a supernova explodes perhaps every 50 years or so. Um, so it's not really a very high rate that's happening for us in the Milky Way. Our Milky Way galaxy is, again, a great place for us to live, right? Um, we're in our corner of the universe here, on the corner of our galaxy in our little quiet solar system neighborhood. And for the most part, that means that things are actually pretty calm. However, in other places of the universe, in younger galaxies, for example, or in galaxies that are undergoing bursts of star formation or merging with other galaxies, that a lot more excitement could be happening. And in those places, that means a lot more stars could be exploding. And if you're very close to an exploded star, that huge amount of energy is not going to be good for any human-like life if it were to exist. Um, so that is a long way of saying that exploding stars can be dangerous if you're close to them, but we are safe here where we are in our tiny little corner of the universe. Um, there's another question. Um, Connor wants to know how much ultraviolet radiation there is in space. That's a great question too. Um, so there is less of the highest energy material. As you get higher on that electromagnetic spectrum that I showed you, there's a little less of that um, information out there. So for example, when Chandra's looking at objects, the X-ray photons, those packets of energy that are traveling towards us, there's just less of them to capture than there are the bits of packets of energy in the optical light or the infrared kinds of light. And similarly for ultraviolet light, there's not quite as much as there is in the optical and infrared regime, um, but more than X-ray as far as I know. So you can think of things like stars, for example. Our sun definitely gives off quite a decent amount of ultraviolet radiation. That's why here on Earth, many of us have to protect our skin with like sunscreen, for example, to block any of that UV radiation causing damage to the cells in our skin. Um, elsewhere in the universe, there's lots of stars just like the sun. There's billions and billions of them. So ultraviolet light from those kinds of stars alone is definitely something worth capturing. Um, but there's many different other kinds of objects too that also give off ultraviolet light. It's just that there's not quite as much UV light as there is optically and from what I believe, infrared light. Um, let's see, I think I answered that one about black holes. Um, there's a question from Zayden who would like to know what would happen to our solar system if the sun exploded? Cool question. So fortunately our sun is not big enough to explode. Again, we're all safe here. Um, but if our sun did explode, it would not be good for us. Um, fortunately, it can't. But what is interesting is our sun, I think I mentioned earlier, can only live for, say, another six, seven billion years. That's billion with a B, so quite a long time. And so we're about halfway through the, the sun's existence, if you will. As the sun starts to age, it will actually start to expand and it'll become a red giant. And as it does so, we think it will definitely engulf up to say Venus. Maybe it'll get really close or sort of close enough to engulf the Earth, perhaps in that red giant phase. It's kind of like as the sun's getting a little bit like cranky as it's getting older. Um, but even if it only enlarges to about this, the location of where Venus is, life would not be good on Earth any longer. Uh, maybe in some of the farther out planets we could hang perhaps, but definitely not not on Earth. Again, that's not for like six billion years though. So I hope no one has any nightmares tonight. We are totally fine for a very long time. Um, but after that phase, um, it'll then start to shrink down and it's puffing off its outer layers, as I mentioned. And so it'll eventually form a really, really beautiful planetary nebula, which I think is kind of exciting that even in a star's death, it tends to be really just a gorgeous thing to witness and a really interesting thing to learn about. Because you can learn a lot about a star's life through its death. Um, all right. So let's see if there are any questions that I haven't got to as we're wrapping up. We've only got another minute or so. Are there going to be any astronomical events that might happen soon that will be visible from Earth? Well, there will be a pair of really fantastic solar eclipses coming up in 2023 and 2024. Um, both will definitely be visible from the US if you're located in the US. And I would highly recommend a solar eclipse. A total solar eclipse is a very, very cool thing to witness because as that sun's light is blocked, you feel the change. Um, the insects and the animals around you seem to get confused, like some of those dusk things, like 
crickets and things like that will start making noise as if dusk is actually happening. It's a really interesting phenomena to witness. Um, so those are the ones that are coming to mind. There are always really interesting things like that. I think at least things like blood moons and super moons, that kind of stuff. Our moon is a very cool object to be able to check out. Um, so some of that should also be fun. Um, but as far as like, if you're thinking more about like exploded stars or, you know, massive jets or anything like that coming towards earth, we're, we're pretty safe where we are. So I hope that, I hope that helps. Um, and I think I've gotten to all of the questions if I believe. So, um, if there is nothing else in the chat, we can wrap up for the day. Cool. All right. So thank you so much for joining us. I hope you really did enjoy getting to learn a little bit more about the Chandrix Observatory and how it's operated, all the different kinds of coding languages and different kinds of software that we use to keep things going and to learn about the incredible universe that we all live in. Um, it's been really lovely getting to be here with you all. Thank you very much for the fantastic questions. I always enjoy good questions, even when I have no answers. I appreciate um, seeing what you all are thinking of. So thanks so much for joining us. And Karen, thanks for helping out with everything today. Uh, lovely job. Bye, all. Okay, thank you.